So today I'm going to talk about uh, a topic that is one of my favorite topics to discuss, which is the evolving management of severe aortic stenosis, and give a little update on where we are in 2023. As Dr. Reardon mentioned, I am the Surgical Director of the Structural Heart and Valve Center at Emory University, and I am a cardiac surgeon. Um, so I always like to start with a case presentation, and in this case, we have a 68-year-old female. She's symptomatic in New York Heart Association Class 3. Um, she has known about her aortic stenosis for over a year. Her cardiologist diagnosed her after an echocardiogram and hearing a murmur and actually advised her to kind of slow down. So she stopped playing tennis and she's um, now in AFib and on Elquis. Her creatinine is 1.2. However, because of her young age, she's low risk for surgery. You can see her echocardiogram has a mean gradient of almost 60 at this point. With an average area of 20.8, she would likely get a 19 or 21 millimeter um, surgical valve, which would be quite small. Um, an intraannular valve, uh, such as a sapien valve, would also be of the smaller sizes. However, a self-expanding valve may have larger options for her. And interestingly, in the 2022 guidelines, they put shared decision-making, what the patient wants as the primary uh, focus. Now, that has to be within the realm of all the other assessments, and I want to be very clear that this guideline is based on transfemoral TAVR, not transaxillary, not transaortic, not any alternative access, but those patients who are eligible for straightforward transfemoral TAVR. Shared decision making, and then their risk assessment. For high risk patients, well, TAVR should be the first line therapy that's been well demonstrated in the, in the studies. For elderly patients age 80 or above, Transfemoral TAVR is class one. But for our patient, she falls into this category, class one for SAVR or TAVR. So how do we help her understand what's the best first choice, especially in a patient who may require more than one valve in her lifetime? So what the patient wants matters. I want to play tennis again. I don't want a pacemaker. And I don't want my chest cracked open. But when we think about the lifetime management, there are many considerations to think of. She's only in her 60s, and so her age and how many valves she will need in her lifetime become very important. She has minimal comorbidities. Her root anatomy is favorable for all platforms, although her annulus is small. She's tricuspid. If she was bicuspid, as are many of our young patients, do we have data to support bicuspids? Well, we have some data, there are registries, but there's no randomized control trial. TAVR or SAVR first. And if we do a TAVR first, what about coronary reaccess, reintervention, patient prosthesis mismatch, PVL, pacemakers, and commissure alignment? All of these things need to be taken into consideration as we counsel our patients on what are, what's best. Although our patient may come to us and say, I don't want my chest cracked open. It may make the most sense. And it's up to us to help counsel the patient based on what we know. When we think about the probability of reoperation based on surgical data for a 65 year old patient, it's about 20%. So it's not 100%, but this is based on surgical valves and the unknown of TAVR durability. I hope this is true but I can't promise my patient this. I will say that I do believe that if you start with a young patient, 60 years old or younger, at some point in their lifetime, they're going to need a sternotomy. And what we've learned from the explant TAVR registries and data is that that risk is not the risk of their initial surgery. It's much higher. So let's talk a little bit about when TAV and TAV is feasible, because that's what this patient is asking. Am I going to be able to get a second TAV or I don't want my chest cracked open? Well, there's an increased risk of coronary obstruction. And what we learned is that with coronary obstruction, the mortality is greater than 50%. It's a devastating complication. In failed surgical valves, we know this is feasible. However, in a TAV and TAV, and I specifically use a, a superannular self-expanding valve because of the tall leaflets, we create what is a leaflet neoskirt or the equivalent of a covered stent. And risk, 
not only obstructing the coronaries, but also sequestering the sinuses, the leaflets reaching all the way to the sinotubular junction and completely closing off that sinus and creating sinus sequestration. So in the lifetime management of young patients with severe aortic stenosis, where are we in 2023? What the patient wants matters. They wanna feel better and they wanna live longer. They wanna start with a valve with the largest EOA and lowest gradient. And in this case, in this patient who was adamant she didn't want surgery, that meant a self-expanding valve, superannular valve. However, if I would have talked her into surgery, that would have put the onus on me. And I would have needed to do a root enlargement. And there are some new techniques, including a bow yang Y incision that Dr. Reardon is very familiar with, that's providing us easier tools as surgeons in order to put a large first valve platform so that we can build on it over time. Lowest risk of complications for the initial procedure, both patient prosthesis mismatched and pacemaker. And I talked about some ways that we've used the cusp overlap technique to reduce pacemakers and try to make it equivalent across surgery, balloon expandable, and self-expanding valves. 